Hello there and welcome back to the studio today. In today's episode we are going to finish up this painting. So this is a classical portrait painting that we have been working on for several episodes now. And the technique that I'm using as you know is Yupari's classical technique. It's the technique that I'm doing some formal writing on. And this painting is going to uh, serve as an example for each of the stages. So we are in the final stage today. So we are in the selective render stage. So that means that we are selectively choosing which areas to apply more focus. So on the palette here, we have titanium white, flake white, burnt umber, lizard crimson permanent, cadmium red, medium, yellow ochre, sap green, ultramarine blue, ivory black, and Neil McGill medium. Oh, and this palette that I'm using, I keep forgetting to mention the palette. Uh, this is a palette that I like to call Lumpy. It is a large uh, standard uh, wooden palette from the Turtlewood brand. And if you would like to know exactly what materials I'm using and or purchase the same type of materials that I'm using, I now have the affiliate links in my description box down below, right next to the title of the specific item that I'm using that is the uh, you know the paint the brand of the paint or some of the brushes and if you do decide to click on the link and purchase something Amazon will pay me a small amount so thank you again in advance for that so how about we go ahead and mix up the color value web so we're going to use a little bit of Neo McGill medium burnt umber alizarin or sorry yeah alizarin crimson permanent ivory black ultramarine blue and that's going to be our darkest dark so now we're going to combine the cadmium red and the sap green and yes I am using complementary colors because they neutral out uh, quite nicely into a nice and subtle warm dark color and now we're going to move up into the yellow ochre combined with the cadmium red medium and now that we are approaching the middle tones of the color value web now we're going to put in the flake white and remember flake white has this property of which it allows you to use more of it without raising the value too much as you're seeing there which then allows you to have uh, basically a thicker paint. So now our model's flesh tones for her skin complexion is a little pinker. So I'm gonna use, I'm using now the alizarin crimson permanent with the titanium white. See how much lighter the titanium white gets with less, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using less paint and it's becoming much and much, much lighter. So the titanium white is gonna live in the lighter values and the flake white is going to live in the middle tone values. So now a little more of the cadmium red, yellow ochre, titanium white, and don't worry I'll show you the image of the model as we are painting. I'm just trying to give you a nice close-up view of the flesh tone mixtures. And now the lightest light. And after I'm done mixing up these uh, local flesh tones, I will tell you that I will tint this color value web once in a while. So I might, I might say that I want this to be warmer or cooler, greener or pinker. I can always tint the color value web now with these colors. The next thing I'm going to do is get a little more Neo McGill medium, different brush. So I'm going to apply the ivory black, ultramarine blue. So this is a little trick that I've been uh, learning recently you know just experimenting so the we're going to create a little cool color value web here and we're going to let this color mix with the flesh tone see this automatically automatically it's getting lighter and now we're going to have some kind of middle tones in between and so now we have a color value web a smaller one right around here. So I'm going to do the same thing for the warmer tones. So the Neo McGill medium, alizarin crimson permanent, just alizarin crimson permanent. Now a little bit of cadmium red. Okay, just alizarin crimson permanent, cadmium red. And now automatically it's getting lighter and lighter. And I'll be able to take from this. Uh, directly if I want something warmer or pinker 
So it just saves a little bit of time to have these, uh, I guess I'm going to call them like the, these rails, like a, a warm rail and a cool rail. And now we're going to get some smaller brushes and we're going to start to uh, work on some of these selected areas that we want to selectively render. So I'm going to take a little bit from the middle tone. And we are now going to start to paint in the smaller shapes for the nose. Remember last time we rendered out the eyes and I don't think I'm going to oil out the painting again uh, just because I think that the darks are still pretty pretty well intact. So I'm not going to apply an extra layer of oil. I'm just going to work directly onto this layer now. So again remember the selective render is quite tedious. It's the most tedious part I think to this process next to the block in in the underpainting stage. So what I'm doing is I'm going to pick a plane, any plane, okay? So I'm going to choose this one right here. And I'm using the warm dark-ish value within the color value web. Now I I did omit the nose ring. I think I'll paint it in uh, later on. I just want to have the structure of the nose uh, solidified a little a little more. So off camera here I'm using a little bit of my odorless mineral spirits to clean off the brush because I'm now going to transition into a darker and cooler hue. So now what we're going to do is apply, I think, you know, I think that's actually the color from the underpainting. So we should be able to go much darker now. And in fact we can. And this is not the darkest we can go. We can still go darker than this. So remember, pick a plane, any plane, okay? So we chose this plane, and now we're going to relate the value of this plane and the shape of this plane with this one. And so this is the dark of the nostril, okay? And what you want to do is close up the forms now. And so closing up the forms just means, um, you know, applying or giving yourself the ability to use the entire value spectrum color value spectrum and then just you know like we're doing here paint one plane next to another plane and relate it in terms of its value and its hue. Now on the previous stage to this one um, we and the previous stage to this one was the perceptual color stage where we weren't so worried about closing up the forms it wasn't a problem to leave an area such as the nose unfinished as it is, um, as it was. Because the idea of the previous layer was to um, differentiate the value relationships, the color and value relationships in the larger areas. And now what we're doing is we're building onto those uh, larger color relationships with smaller planes. But we're kind of fitting the temperatures, the hues, and the values according to that larger scaffolding that we created in the last layer. So now over here it's going to get a little, whoops, it's too dark. And I know to, to some, some folks the idea of using a small brush in such a tiny confined area usually sends up some warning signs, uh, warning signs. Um, but I'll tell you what, at, at the end in the selective render stage we have already answered the question of big shape. We've already answered the question of large values. So really all we're doing now is just applying the same kind of focus that we used in the big picture, now in the small picture. Now there, there isn't a plane too small to uh, you know, ignore, so we're not going to ignore even this little plane here, the side of the bulb of the nose. So the bulb of the nose is a little, uh, I will admit it's a little warmer than that, so I'm going to go warmer. And like I said when I made the color value web, I'm going to say things like that. I'm going to make it warmer, I'm going to make it cooler, greener, pinker. And all I'm doing is I'm just tinting. I'm just tinting the, um, the color a certain, you know, towards a certain direction. And 
And as you paint in these, these values, you really want to think about uh, relating each shape to one another. That's the key. And try to stand back as far as possible. Notice you can't really see my face in this camera shot because I'm not standing too close to the painting. So even though, uh, you know, we're finishing, quote unquote, finishing the painting, you know, I'm still not, you know, my face isn't right towards the, um, the canvas. You know, this isn't the SAT exam. Like this isn't, uh, you know, I'm not taking any kind of, you know, exam where I need to be like right in front of the, you know, the sh exam sheet. I used to call them Scantron sheet and you'd be filling in each thing. Like that's not what we're doing. The, the more you stand back, the more objectivity you have with the shapes that you're painting in. But in any case, what am I doing here? So I'm going to look at this shape for the nostril right here, or the side of the wing of the nose, okay? And I'm going to draw out the boundary for that shape. Okay, so it comes over here and down here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to relate the shape surrounding the nostril. So I perceive this area to be cooler, okay? And so what I'm going to do, what I'm doing is I'm taking from that cooler color that we had in that, um, you know, that the railroad kind of thing that we did next to the color value web. And we're pushing it cooler. And I will admit I'm making it lighter in value. And it's lighter because of all the ambient light in the room when this photo reference was taken. And then it's going to be warmer around here, but I think it, it's fine the way it is. What I must do now is, you know, eliminate this line, turn it into a value. So that is too warm and it's too dark. There we go. Now I'm starting to establish more of a, a boundary for the nose. An edge is very, very important, okay? I'm keeping the edges as soft as possible in the shadow. a little bit darker right here for the root of the nose and a little bit sharper actually. I want the focus to go towards here and not towards there. And now we're going to put in some of these dark lights. Remember the dark light is the value just in between uh, you know the shape of the light and dark. And it's the most telltale value uh, in terms of the curvature of the form. Now we're starting to work our way out of the darks. That might be a little too red. So I want to get some of the cooler colors. It's a little better. Very careful with this transition. So now with a different brush, I just lightly soften this shape. Now we're getting closer and closer to closing up the form for good. You know, in yesterday's episode with the eyes, I really did spend a long time on the eyes. So I will be showing you, um, you know, how I go about approaching closing up the forms. But I may not be able to show every single brush stroke of it. Otherwise, you know, your daily episodes are going to be hours long. 
And we'll do some of that in the future, like we did before, by splitting up the videos. But right now what I'm trying to do is give you a more concise method. Now we've worked our way up towards the highlight. All right, so that's that's closing up the form pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, should I put in the nose ring? Hmm, do I want to put in the nose ring? How about we flip a coin? All right, so I now have a quarter here. So heads, we paint the nose ring. Tails, we leave the nose ring out. So let's go ahead and flip this quarter. All right, are you ready for this? All right, so it looks like we have heads. <laughs> that means that we are going to paint the nose ring. Now using a little bit of the ivory black ultramarine blue and some Neo McGill medium, we're going to put in the nose ring. And of course I don't want the edge to be super sharp on the nose ring, so what I'm going to do is just kind of tap onto the dark a little bit, just to selectively soften this edge around here. Now with the same brush, a little bit of the titanium white into the cooler area of the color value web. Now we're going to put in the little half tones for the nose ring. So they are very subtle, very almost imperceptible. So now a little more titanium white into the mix and some of the Neo McGill medium to thin out the paint. I'm going to put in the little highlights. Okay, I might have to thin out the paint a little more. So I'm actually going to use a little bit of mineral spirits to thin out the paint even further, just to get it to stick. There we go. And that's all. And now, instead of going automatically towards the lips, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the larger structures surrounding the lips, and then I'm going to make my way towards uh, putting in more uh, areas for the lips, but since this is selective render, I really don't think that I'm going to render that much out uh, for the lips. And just aesthetically, I don't know. I don't want the lips to be as rendered as the eyes or the nose. So I think I'm going to work these areas around here. So I'm going to get a larger brush and I think we're going to stick in this little area. And I do want to tint the web a little bit pinker because this is a little too orangey, a little too, you know, a little too brown. So we're going to use the alizarin crimson. And like I said, I would eventually most likely tint the colors in the color value web. I'm going to try to angle the palette just so you don't have any glare. Okay, see how I'm tinting it? And of course, I'm still going to continue to tint the colors, but you know, this is uh, kind of in a very basic, uh, this is very basically how I'm going to tint it. I may end up using more of a different color, but I just wanted this area to be a little pinker. And so now I'm going to approach this area with a lot of caution. So I think that I will actually oil out a little bit in this area. So select the render now, okay? So I'm going to oil out right over here. And that's because I'm gonna to wanna to use a very transparent application of paint now. I'm not gonna oil out the shadow though, just this area. I'm going to leave this blank. Well, it's not blank, but you know what I mean. Now that there's a little bit of oil on here, I'm going to choose the areas that I want to that I want to bring into more focus. So, first things first, the zygomatic bone, so the cheekbone. Now we already established the relative color 
families in the perceptual color stage. So we decided that this area was a little more pinkish than this area. This area was a little more yellowish than this one. So now, like I said, um, I tinted the color value web more pink. And this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, I have to rely on my knowledge of uh, form, and don't worry, I'm going to share that with you. So here, okay, pick a plane, any plane, and now start to uh, selectively render each stage. Well, something's wrong with the photo reference. Like, this is too flat. All of this area is way too flat in the photo reference. So again, that's why I usually say it's very important to understand uh, form. And don't worry, I'm, I'm really going to start to, or I am, I'm working on some online and uh, online teaching resources that will help you uh, train. So my idea is to create training resources because you know you can watch, uh, you can watch a thousand, you can watch me paint this a thousand times, but I think now watching what I'm doing and then taking the uh, the exercises that I'm going to give you in the future will help you tremendously. Okay, so now this plane is getting darker, but I have to be very careful with how dark I make it. So that's why I'm using the transparency of the paint, so the layer underneath. So when I said that this was going too flat, and it's a little too, I don't know, it's like a blue, gray, green, which I don't think it was that color from life. I think that the photograph is distorting the color a little bit here. So it's a very thin application of paint. We're putting in a kind of neutral pink half tone that's a little bit darker. And in the selective render stage, uh, you're going to do a lot. Like there's going to be a lot of pushing the paint around, but it's not going to appear very evident. Not like when we're doing the uh, underpainting or the perceptual color or even the local color stage. So we're going to make a lot of little decisions here, but those little tiny decisions, you know, they're not going to be so obvious is what I'm saying. So now over here, see that's a little too red. I'm going to make it cooler, and I made it cooler using the cooler area in the color value web. And now I'm just going to kind of blend that shape out with a dry brush. Now we're starting to get that half tone to read that shape. Um, now I'm actually standing back, and that, that shape looks a little too dark, so I'm going to diffuse the shape a little bit, a, a little bit. It's like spreading like butter on bread or something like that. There we go. Now if I make this too dark, I'm going to get someone in the comments saying that I kind of made her cheeks uh, different, so I got to be careful with that. Now remember, subtlety just means how close can you make the values to one another yet maintain their subtle differentiation. So right now, I want this to be even more subtle than I have it. And I'm using the transparency of the paint to help me with that. And I'm trying to not paint so opaque. And that's because I do want the layers underneath to show through, just because human skin, you know, it's not perfectly smooth. There are, you know, little facets and things in our skin. Now, if I over render or make things overly soft, it will start to look kind of fake, kind of almost like a, you know, like a porcelain doll or something. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay, don't get me wrong. It's just that's not the aesthetic that I'm after. And then I realized I left this shape a little too sharp. 
softening that too. Anyway, um, so now the same kind of thing is going to happen down here. So that's too warm. So we're making it cooler, even cooler. And this takes a lot of patience, okay? Um, but this patience to the patience to work on a painting, especially using a classical approach for several layers, you know, um, it's it's something that you build. I think today I have more patience in working on this painting just because I stopped last time when I was working on the eyes. Remember, uh, I told you guys I was getting tired, and I was. This takes a lot of focus, and it, it's really tiring after a while. So if you're getting to a point in the selective render where you're starting to feel a little tired and a little less motivated to continue working, that's a good time to let the painting rest. And we move on to another painting that same day. And then come back to it. And it's so peaceful. It's so relaxing. I'm telling you, this is one of the most relaxing things in the world. I'm not going to lie, it is stressful sometimes. You know, like when the form just doesn't work, or when the lips are in the wrong place, or you know, when you have to move an eye a little bit like I did last time, like in yesterday's episode. It's a little frustrating. But if it wasn't, wouldn't it get kind of boring? So now just using the, um, the dry brush soften. So now we have much more curvature. So now our the, the mandible is starting to look much more solid and you can still see the layer underneath showing through. So the perceptual color stage, you know where we push the color uh, variations and all of that is showing through the now closed forms that we have all around here. So now I think one last one I'm missing is right there. So the side of the top plane of the orbicularis oris, this is the orbicularis oris, okay? This structure all around here. So it's going to be a little darker. And this is a very classical way of working. You know, I really do feel at home when I'm holding the palette, an artist palette. You know, underpainting, layering, it really does make me feel at home. But I, painting in general makes me feel that way. What am I talking about? What I'm doing is I'm pushing this plane a little bit darker, uh, so I'm relating it to the surrounding planes. And I did minimize the smile a little bit. Notice how I didn't push this value. So, uh, let's see. Let's now start to make it more like the picture without copying the picture. A little darker there. Oh my goodness, this is such subtle stuff. This is very subtle. A little darker there. Very careful. And if you make a mistake, you can easily wipe off the, uh, the mistake. Okay, so now I have that tone. Now the next one, let's go ahead and look at the bottom of the orbicularis oris. So right over here. It's actually darker. And I had it. And notice how the volume is really starting to read. It surprises me every time. The effects that we can get with just the oil paint. And our medium, of course. A little darker there. Got to be careful, so I don't want to overdo uh, these shapes. Let's go ahead and soften a little bit. And now it looks like um, 
I think we've actually worked our way towards the mouth. So how about we start to put in some more shapes for the mouth. All right, I have now moved the camera much closer and it is at a more severe angle with respect to the canvas. So just, just note that the camera will be at a slight angle. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to paint in this bridgeway plane. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So this plane right here is the bridge weight between this plane and this plane, okay? So remember, pick a plane, any plane, and then start to subdivide the shapes surrounding that plane and relate the values. That's the key. Keep relating the values and the colors. So I see that there's a little uh, plane right here that I have overlooked because it's so tiny. Right over here. That's a plane that's turning right into the mouth. I'm almost thinking about it like a sculptor. What would a sculptor do to get this curve for the mouth if they were working with a, a thing of clay? They would probably just like, you know, chop right into the clay and then mold around it. And this right here is kind of like the chop into the clay. So we're thinking very sculptural. And notice I'm using the smaller brush now. This is the tiny brush. It's because these shapes are going to be much smaller now. So it looks like the mouth has a much more articulated shape than I gave it credit for. So down here and up. Okay, so up, flat. So it flattens out there and then it tapers over here. Oops. See what happens when you make a mistake? And just wipe it off. Isn't that neat? Okay. All right, so now we have that dark shape. So this is looking a little wonky. So I have to work on that value. I don't know where I got that word from. Somebody once said wonky, like when I was at Studio in Kaminati. I forgot who said it. I think it was a teacher named Jen something. I don't know. I, I, pick, I pick up like uh, little words like wonky or whatever from, from folks and it just sticks with me. really in the small world right now at these shapes. And I purposefully didn't paint in the value for the hair yet just because I'm resting my hand on the hair, basically. Okay, so now I'm gonna soften Now we have that transition. It's a very difficult transition. Are you starting to see me struggle again? So don't think that this is just like a piece of cake for me, even though I've painted, uh, you know, hundreds of portraits. I learn something new each time. I have a feeling today's episode might be a little bit longer. 
but I'm really just trying to slow down and show you as much as I can. You know, you're seeing a lot of back and forth-ish kind of movement as I continue to solidify these shapes. I'm trying to give you the, you know, I'm trying to give you footage of things that I would have wanted to see when I was first learning. There we go. See that? Now we have that transition a little more solid. Took a while, a long while, but we now have this little transition. And like I said, selective render, okay? I'm not going to spend as much time as I spent right here everywhere. That's the key. I keep saying that's the key. Well, what's wrong with me? Uh, that's just the idea, okay? <laughs> we pick an area that we want to bring into focus, and that just happened to be an area that I wanted to bring into focus. You know, whereas the rest of it I didn't want to put too much focus on. Okay, so now the bottom or the lower lip shape goes down a little bit more. Okay, so I have that shape that I wanted. And now this looks too much like an outline, so I'm going to put in a value very similar to that line. Just push it right in front of the line there. Now with a little bit of Neo McGilp, we're going to put more specificity into the filtrum. following the shape for the filtrum. There we go. Now there's going to be a little teeny tiny plane there for the filtrum. The side plane of the filtrum. I like the word filtrum. I'm being really weird today. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with me. I purposefully didn't drink coffee today, just so my hand wouldn't be too shaky. There we go. So now we have more of a shape for the filtrum. We're on a roll here. So there's the shape for the filtrum on one side. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Spoke too soon. A little half tone over here. Okay. Now, just have to make it softer. Whoops, wrong brush, wrong brush. Okay. Clean, dry, synthetic brush. Going to soften these shapes. That was a lot of <laughs> that was a lot of stuff that we did there for the uh, the nose, the cheekbones, and in the lips. You know, a lot of conceptual thinking went into that. But one thing I really want to share with you, I think this is actually really important. I'm going to show you the way that I have been mixing colors on the palette. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the palette right here. I'm going to bring the camera over here and show you. Now you can see exactly what I was talking about in terms of sticking to the color value web using this warm rail using this cool rail to the color value web I don't know what I'm gonna call it is this a cool string is it a cool rail whatever it's it, this cool color value web that you saw me mix up earlier see right here right there see how you know at one point I decided to go right into this area here and then go right into this area here 
and see how everything maintained itself in this area. And then, of course, there's the light that I mixed up for the, the nose ring. And I just really love palettes in general. I just, I'm, I'm going on a tangent here, I'm sorry, but I really love palettes and, you know, the kind of stories that they tell. And you can see Lumpy here in my palette has so, so many battle scars from, uh, you know, painting day in, day out. Just I just love this stuff. And I just wanted to share that with you because I, I really do feel a connection uh, with the painting when I'm able to hold a palette. I don't know, it's just how I feel. Uh, question of the day, do you enjoy holding a, a palette while you're painting? And um, you know, how does that make you feel? For me, it just, just positive. <laughs> I love holding uh, palettes and painting. Anyway, now um, what I've said, I've said all I needed to say, okay, uh, for the face. So the face I now consider done. Uh, I applied the selective render stage. Now the last thing I'm going to do is the hair. I usually leave the hair for last just because it kind of frames the face. So what I'm going to do is mix up another little value web and I think I'm going to mix this value web like somewhere over here just because I have all this extra space over here. So the Neo McGill Ivory Black Burnt Umber, a Lizard Crimson. And I'm using the Burnt Umber to uh, lighten up the value of the Ivory Black and then I'm using the Lizard Crimson Permanent to warm up the color a little bit without altering the value too much. Let's see if I can get you closer to this mixture. So that is going to be the dark for the hair. To make the light of the hair, I'm going to use just yellow ochre. And to be honest, taking a little bit from the flesh tone. So that'll be for the light of the hair. So, you know, I think I'm going to use the same brush between dark and light, though you probably can't really see the difference with the light too much. And now I'm going to remix the background color because um, you know, the, the hair is directly uh, next to the background color, essentially. So the alizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red. This is why I like to have all of this space on the palette. And the Flake White. I don't know, I think a little bit of Burnt Umber, just so we don't have such a saturated red in the background because that red isn't really that saturated. And we're just going to want a little more paint. Burnt Umber, whoops, I got paint on myself. So the Burnt Umber, Cadmium Red, Burnt Umber, Lizard, Crimson Permanent, more Burnt Umber, and that should be good. We're actually going to oil out the hair, but just the hair. Eh, you know what? I change my mind a lot, as you may have noticed. Let's just oil out the hair and the background. So I'm selectively oiling out certain areas, like, you know, I didn't oil out here. You know that I didn't oil out there. See how it helps to bring back the background color? Actually, it helps a lot to bring back the background color. Now I'm noticing I made the background color way more bright than the color I just mixed up, which is okay. All right, so now we have that nicely, nicely covered. Let's see, background color that I was talking about. Oh, well. It's a little lighter, I don't know, let's see, the alizarin crimson permanent. Uh, let's even throw in some ultramarine blue this time. There we go. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically put in the uh, shape side by side. So this is what I mean by side by side. So here's the dark of the hair. I'm going to be working both of these shapes simultaneously. 
you know, not, this isn't really simultaneously, but, you know, at, at the same relative time. And I am going to leave some of the underpainting under here to show through just because I think it looks cool when the underpainting shows through a little bit. Pushing in that shape. I don't want to do too much for the hair. And like I said yesterday, um, you know, each, every one of us, you included, has a, a unique touch, a unique signature. And like I said yesterday, I don't mean signature like signing a painting or anything. I mean signature in terms of the way you paint. You know, you, you may decide to put in more information for the hair than I would. You know, you may end up putting less and it just, it's just the way you paint. It's the way you think. It's the way you approach things. And that's unique to you. Like I was saying yesterday, the art is within you. You don't need to search for it. It's already there. You just have to, we all have to, you know, train as much as we can to improve on our technique. And the more we improve on our technique, you know, the more we are able to convey uh, whatever it is we want to convey in our paintings. You know, the more we train, the more our unique signature will come into focus. It's just the nature of it. So I don't want too much for the hair. And I realize I should probably get that camera in a close-up shot. So let me move the camera. All right, here you are in close-up shot. Hopefully you can uh, see this, though it's not in focus. So with a, uh, a different brush, the wrong brush, <laughs> Try it again. I know it's not in focus, but with a clean and dry brush, ah, I'm taking a risk here. I don't know if this is on the camera, but okay. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to put in the lights for the hair using the you know the lighter mixture that we mixed up before. But I don't want it to be too cold. Okay, uh, I got to be very careful with the temperature of this color. If I make it too cold, like I kind of am there. The, then the hair will, you know, the light on the hair will not match up with the dark values that we made before. So this won't match with that if I make it too um, cool. And this is what I mean by, um, you know, each one of us has our own distinct um, touch, is that not, not only is it like the same as, as handwriting, but uh, you know, I think just the way that I'm applying the brush stroke, okay, is unique to me. You know, the way Bouguereau applied his brush stroke was unique to Bouguereau. Sargent, it was unique to Sargent. And the way you will apply it in your own paintings is unique to you. It's your own signature. That's what makes you unique. That's what makes you special. All right, a little more light up here. We're almost there. Almost done. It's been a long journey. And I want to leave this area soft because I did soften it in the previous stages because you usually want the edge around the hair to be relatively soft. I mean, around the hairline, that is. There we go. Some more little highlights there. I'm gonna leave this kind of dark. So let's go ahead and Put that dark shape in. I don't want to cover too much though. I don't want to lose that underpainting. I don't want to, I don't want to lose this shape here and this one there. In the future, I want, I want people to be able to see that I used an underpainting. You can still kind of see it showing through over here and 
from there. Just a few more touches. So we're going to soften a few more last edges before we call this finished. That one definitely needed to be softened. I don't know, maybe some more softening over here. Yep. Okay. And there's one last thing to do, and I think you know what this means. A little bit of odorless mineral spirits there. We're going to use burnt umber because brown is my favorite color. And with that, we have now concluded this painting demonstration. Remember, this was the last stage of a four-stage process. The first was the underpainting stage, local color stage, perceptual color stage, and then selective render. This was the selective render stage. And this is a technique that I'm doing some formal writing on, remember? And I'm going to call this Upari's classical technique. So I will get all of the videos associated with this painting demonstration and I'll put it into a playlist for you to be able to watch it, uh, you know, from the first one all the way till today's episode. That being said, Always remember, in a world that can be so negative, be the spark that ignites positivity amongst all of us. I really do hope that you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you tomorrow.